This conference will now be recorded. Hello, well, everyone. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's, it's, Sorry, no, no, can't go ahead. And... No, no introduction is necessary. They have your your bio and all the information and your reputation procedures. So we are glad to have you to join this course and walk us through this. Thank you for your support and for your time this evening. It's all yours. Also, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to your students. And um, I want to show my face first and I will turn it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like, okay, hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> okay. So I can start the presentation. And, you know, if um, during this presentation, if you have any question, you know, you can stop me anytime or you can type in your questions and I'll be happy to address them for you. Right. And um, I'll, uh, you know, try to break things down and go a little bit slow because I want you to understand um, the basic information about coding and categorizing your data. So the title of this presentation is Coding Qualitative Data, a Practical Guide to Completing Qualitative Data Analysis. And um, most of the information I'm going to give you um, is from my book, uh, which was published this year and it gives all the information about coding and analyzing and using software and if you want to do it manually i have all the information in there for you in case you're interested so for this presentation i'm going to talk about features of qualitative data the meaning of coding coding strategies and how to determine an appropriate coding strategy that you want to use and also what are the steps of coding? And I'll talk a little bit of memoing, um, recording your reflections as you are coding your data. And I'll also give a brief information about the code categorization strategies and also how to you know, determine the appropriate categorization strategy for your study. Um, so what is what are the features of qualitative data, right? So to be more, to, to simplify the process, any data that is not quantified is a qualitative data, right? And sometimes they, people call it unstructured data because it doesn't follow specific formats, you know, mostly words, sometimes uh, visuals, or um, it can be audio and also video. So all these kind of um, information will help you to determine what qualitative qualitative data is all about, right? And so what is coding? Think about coding as summarizing, right? You spoke to a lot of participants and they gave you many information that you wish you want to share with into your audience, but audience, they don't have time to listen to everything that a, a participant tells you. So what are you going to do? You have to summarize the information and give it to them. But you cannot just do ordinary summary because you want them to trust the information that you got from them. And then what are you going to do? You have to do coding. So coding is all about assigning phrases to relevant information in the data and those phrases will help you to address your research question at the same time the phrases are representing the significant information in the data so that's all about coding and it's all about data reduction you are reducing the data but you are not losing the meaning of the behind the data that participant uh, gave it to you so you always have to be it, it should be a systematic process right step-by-step -step process so that your audience or your readers will believe what you found in your data. So there are many strategies that you could use, but uh, for my book, I identify three main strategies that you can use to code your data. So we have description focus coding, interpretation focus coding, and presumption focus coding. As the name implies, description focus coding is all about describing relevant information in the data, right? And 
After describing, you develop a phrase called a code to represent the description. And then, so what you are doing, you are just telling what you see or telling what participant is telling you, right? Um, you are not making any judgment. You are not making any interpretation. You are not implying anything. You are just a vessel that participant information will be passing through you. And then you give that information to your audience. No interpretation. You are just describing what they told you. For interpretation focus coding, you are making sense of the relevant information. So after you have identified significant information in the data based on a research question, you ask yourself, what does this information mean? Right, and then based on your, on your understanding of the mean uh, of of the information, you create a phrase to represent that understanding, and a phrase should be able to address your research question that you have. So you always have to have your research question in mind as you are making sense of the data. So you are telling what it means. You reflect on the possible meanings, considering the context who gave you that information? What is the situation they find themselves in? Can that inf the, can the, their background information help you to understand what they are saying, right? So that's how it all about the interpretation focus coding. And in my book, also, I give you a lot of examples of how it, it will look like. The last one is presumption focus coding. You are making presumption, you are making conclusions, right? So you see participant data as evidence. And then based on those evidence that you find in the data, you make conclusions, you make claims. So the claims uh, will be phrases that will be used to represent the evidence that you see in the data, right? So that's also about the third strategy that you can use. So how do you decide the specific strategy that you have to use? So I have this diagram that will help you uh, to do, do that. But before we go through this diagram, let me give you an example. Uh, I don't know whether you have a copy of this document. Um, I, I remember I sent it to Dr. Morris. So, okay, so let's... Um, look through this and see whether we will be able to understand how to use their strategies, right? So let's assume that you have collected data from um, five participants who are doctors, um, and these are their demographic information. So you have their age, their gender, their work um, year of experience, and also their ethnicity, right? And then so the first step that you have to do when you have your data is to decide what coding strategy should I use? And um, you always have to think about, okay, what am I looking for in the data, right? So your, the purpose of the study is to find out uh, more information about burnout among um, primary health care physicians, right? And then you look at your research questions, right? So. Um, looking at these research questions, they are very straightforward. What are the causes of burnout among this population, right? And what should be done to reduce those burnouts? So it's so much direct information that you can get it from your data, especially if you ask during the interview, ask them directly about the experience about burnout and they provided that information to you. So the information is so direct, you can just go through the data and identify those significant information. Because of that, descriptive uh, description focus coding will be the best because your data, um, um, the purpose of the study is to describe what is going on in terms of the burnout, the causes and the solutions, right? And the, you ask them directly. So you got the information directly from them. You don't have to imply or interpret the information. They just gave it to you. You just have to summarize and present it to your audience. And when you look at your data too, the information that you are looking for is not hidden. It's in plain sight because you ask them a direct question about the experience of burnout and they provided you that information. So you don't have to make sense of it before you can 
do the coding. So that's why descriptive uh, description focused coding will be the best, right? It doesn't mean that if you choose the interpretative uh, interpretation focused coding is not good, but when you are choosing the best one, then descriptive, because um, the research question is quite direct and the information you can get it directly from what you um, uh, participants said. So, so that's why first, so the first step that you have to do is to choose the uh, determine the appropriate coding strategy. And for the, in this case, description focused coding will be the best because you just want to describe what they are telling you. And the second step in the coding process is you have to label your research question, right? So you can see that I've labeled for the, my first research question uh, label is burnout causes and the second one burnout solutions, right? The reason why you have to label is that you want to develop code under each of the research questions so that at the end of the day, you'll be able to develop themes that are addressing each of the research questions. You don't want to. So labeling your research question helps with the organization of your code, right? That's why you have to label it, right? And the label uh, is called anchor code. Anchor code. And uh, it's a term that is uh, used in my book. Right, so you label the research question. What will be the next step? The next step is to go to your participant responses and identify excerpts or relevant information and then assign code to them. You create code to represent those information. So as you can see here, um, this, this process is called manual coding. Right, it's because you are manual, you are not using a software. If you are using a software, there's a different process. But if you want to use Microsoft Word to do that, you, when you identify significant information, you just you know select that, right? And then you click on comment, and then you type first, you first type the anchor code, the label that you gave to the research question. So this significant information will be addressing the first research question. That's why I indicated burnout causes. And then um, column, and then you type the code that you, you want to use to represent that information, right? So you can see it here that sometimes you can quote participant as a code, right? Uh, the most important is, is you, the code shouldn't be more than five words. You don't, you don't want to be too long, right? It's between two to five words are very good. So I went through, you know, when you identify significant information, you develop a code. So sometimes what will happen is that as you are doing the coding, you realize that you have identified significant information that you can use to connect to previously developed code. Right, let's say um, one example is, um, I want to give one example here. Um, so let's say you have developed a code here, right? Engaging in meditation, right? And then another participant are talking, making, um, make a statement about, you know, engaging in um, med uh, med meditation as a uh, solution to, um, addressing their burnout, right? So you use the same code that you have already developed to connect to the any information that talks about um, um, medi medica um, meditation, right? So this means that whenever you are develop you identify significant information, you have to ask yourself: Is there any existing code? that you can use to connect to the significant information. If there's no existing, then you can develop a new code, right? So think about it is this way. You have, you have containers, right? The codes are just containers. And then you go to participant um, responses and identify significant information and drop it into those containers, right? So at the beginning, you create new containers, right? So I have a container for having long hours, I have container for having numerous work-related tasks, I have a container for engaging in meditation, right? 
So as you are going through the um, participant responses, right, you may identify information that when you identify significant information, you have to go back and look at your previously developed containers and see whether you'll be able to drop those significant information into that if they are related. If you cannot drop it, if it's not related, you create a new container. Am I making sense? Right. So um, this is how the coding process is. So you code, you identify significant information and do that. And then you move to the next stage where you have to categorize the code. And we are going to talk about that, but um, this is just a brief information about the process. So as I said, as you can see here, you have to first decide the coding strategy, right? And then you label your research question. And then you go through your um, data, right? And identify relevant information that will help you to address the research question and then assign code to them or uh, put them into various containers, right? And then you have to make sure that you, uh, when you create a container or a label, you have to define it. So this means that each of the code that you de develop, you have to define. Why do you have to define? So that when you go back and look at it and ask yourself, what does meditation mean in the context of what participant told you, you'll be able to know the definition of meditation, right? based on the data that you have, so that you'll be able to, especially when you are doing categorizing, when you are categorizing your um, codes, you'll be able to know the meaning of each of the code or what the code stand for. So it's very important to define them. And I also talk a lot about defining the codes or the labels uh, in my book. Then, so the next step that you have to think about is, as you are developing codes, there, are, there will be rich information that will come into mind, right? Because you don't have time to um, reflect on great ideas that comes to mind, what do you have to do? You have to write them down. That is called initial memory, right? So you are recording your thoughts as you are coding your data, right? And then, when you finish coding or when you stop in the middle of the coding, you can go back and reflect on your thought and maybe um, digest that and maybe create more information or uh, think about it and critically think about it and also um, write more reflection. That is who will be analytical coding. So you are analyzing your initial thought, right? You are, during the coding process, you might not be able to pay attention to rich information that comes into mind. That's why you have to record it. And then when you finish coding, you can go back and reflect and add more information to that. And when you are adding more information and analyzing what you have, it's called analytical coding or uh, memory, right? Reflection of um, what you have already written, right? And procedural coding is all about, uh, no, memory is all about recording the step-by-step -step process. The reason why you have to record it is sometimes when you are presenting your findings, people want to know the process and you have to document the process so that you they'll believe what you found. So this is where you record what you are doing the step by step. So the same thing that I did here by telling you uh, the steps that I took to uh, develop code, you can you know uh, list the steps down so that you'll be able to share um, it with um, them with your audience. So that's how you're gonna do it. Any question? Is there any place that I have to explain further <laughs> for you to understand? I think it's pretty pretty simple, but that might be because I've seen I understand it. Uh, I do have some questions, Doctor Do, but I, mm -hmm. I want to 
wait till when's the appropriate time. Like I, I often have conversations with students in this process about the difference between descriptive and interpretive coding and mm -hmm. when is right. And so all the things that you're describing are just part of the process. But I get students sometimes who are almost want to say stuck in descriptive coding when they really need to move into a more interpretive uh, space based on what their research questions are or even their design. Can you talk about, mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, so I always show them um, a table. I don't have it here. Uh, I, I post it on my LinkedIn uh, and that table is also in the book. I gave um, information about if you are using phenomenological approach, what kind of coding um, strategies do you have to use? If you are using greater theory, what kind of coding strategy does you have to use? If you are using interpretative phenomenological analysis, what coding strategy does you have to use? Um, it's all about, it's sometimes difficult to determine, but I try to, you know, differentiate between them. So in terms of the levels, right? The first level of coding is descriptive. And normally you use descriptive coding when you are doing a narrative study, um, because narrative study is all about describing participant stories, right? Um, sometimes when you are doing a phenomenological study where you want to describe participant experience without bringing in your own interpretation, then descriptive uh, description focus coding will be the best. Right. Um, sometimes, although the research question is more of descriptive, but maybe the data, uh, when you look at the data, when you review the data, you realize that answers to the questions are hidden. You have to make sense of the data before you can address the research question then the interpretative uh, interpretation focus coding will be the best you have to make sense you have to ask yourself what does the what what does the participant uh, information mean right and then based on that you can develop code so sometimes it depends on the nature of the data that you have it also depends on the purpose of the study if your purpose of the study is more of descriptive in nature you are describing participant experience you are describing that event then descriptive is, is the best. But if the data that you have is uh, the information that you need is hidden, especially when you are dealing with um, documents, right? The, um, maybe you call it a document and the documents were not generated um, to directly address your research question to us maybe generated years ago, right? And you are using your research question to help you to make sense of the data. So in this case, interpretation focus coding will be the best. Um, presumption focus coding normally is used when you, are, you want to develop a theory, right? You want to develop an explanation to, um, to represent an issue or you want to explain a concept or a phenomenon, right? And most of the time, those who are using granite theory are using the presumption focus coding. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So the next one that you have to think after you have coded your data, you, you realize that um, you have a lot of codes. And as you can see from this example, I have, so I have a lot. So these are the codes I've created. It's a lot. And this is, and as you can see here, I cannot present all this information to my audience, right? Because I have to talk about each of them. And let me see the numbers here. So there are 27 things that I have to talk to my audience and they, they would not have time to listen to everything. So you have to move the next step where you have to um, categorize what you have developed, right? And that's why you have to, you know, you have to determine the uh, categorization strategy that you can use, right? And um, we have three main types. We have individual based sorting strategy, group based sorting strategy, and presumption focus 
strategy. And um, I explain, let me pull this one up again. So the individual based sorting strategy, sorting is all about grouping them based on similarities, right? So, um, and the essence of doing that is to come up with few themes to help you to address a research question, maybe six or five uh, themes or four themes to address your research question that you have. So um, if you are doing a manual coding, right? Um, this is how the sorting happens. Um, so what I did here is after uh, coding all the data, I just select one of the, and I select the first comment, uh, the first code that I've created, select everything and click on shift and then click on down arrow on the keyboard and then to select everything. And then after making sure that everything is selected, you right click on one of them and copy. And then you click on the copy and then you paste it under here, under your document. So this is how I was able to get um, these, um, all the codes, right? that I did. So I copied and pasted them here. So after that, what do you have to do next? You have to arrange it alphabet alphabetically so that you'll be able to uh, separate the first research question, uh, codes that are related to the first research question from the codes who are related to the second research question, right? So I just selected it and then I click on this um, icon A to Z the sort and then to um, arrange it alphabetically for me. And then uh, the next step is consolidate, right? The codes, how do you consolidate, uh, consolidate the code? Yeah. I find it quite to pronounce this one. So yeah. um, you, you, I, you know, I mentioned that some of the, sometimes you will be able to have uh, a code assigned to more than one significant information. So this code has been assigned to two significant information, right? So when you want to put them together, you just delete one of them and then in parentheses, you indicate two because there are two um, co uh, significant information that are, were connected to this code, right? So um, two means that you have identified you went through the data, you identified two relevant information and then um, and you put it in this basket or in this uh, information, in this code. And then you do the same thing. So you go to, you can see that here, we have only one code um, that was uh, one significant information that was connected to um, this code, right? Because it's only uh, um, only one feeling in, inadequate. So you just indicate one, right? And the same thing as uh, for the second one. So you just go through and you can see that having numerous work, work related tasks. You can see here that having numerous work related tasks, there are four. Right, one, two, three, four. So this code were connected to four significant, significant information. So we delete and then only maintain one and then in parentheses you indicate four, right? So that will help you. So why are you doing all these things? It will give you information that, okay, we have um, a, not a perception per se, we have a thinking that the more participants talk about an issue, the more likely that issue is important. So if the participants are talking about this four times, this means that, you know, most of the courses or um, having numerous work related tasks is one of the main causes of, right, um, burnout, right? 
So, so, the, so the more the number or the more significant information, the, uh, the, uh, the likelihood that that information is very important, right? So, um, so you co compile everything, and the next step is the sorting. Individual. The reason why it's individualized sorting is that you, as as a researcher, you are doing it yourself, right? Individual sorting, and we have the group one, and I will talk about the group one um, later. Um, the second one, group with the group means that you are involving people to help you to sort what you have, and then presumption. I also talk about it, but I just want you to understand the first one, which is the one that a lot of students use because they do um, the analysis themselves without involving anybody, right? So the sorting is, one thing that you have to do is you can have a table, right, with about four or five columns, right? And then you first put the important code here. The important code is the the most important code is the one that has highest frequency or highest number of significant information collected. So you can see that you can put it first. You can put it here, right in the first column, and then you go to um, the relevant information. Uh, you go to the um, having a feedback. Right, let me see. Uh, okay. So you go through and then see whether you can group them based on how they are related. So I was able to put them into the various clusters. And then um, after putting them into clusters, you have to um, label the cluster, right? So based on the content or the based on the um, content in the cluster, what label do you want to give to it? And these labels will be the themes that will help you to address the research question. So for the research question one, I have four themes, right? And then I did the same thing for the research question two, and I have five themes. And you can see that I have four here. This means that I added everything, the significant information, one plus one plus two is four, so one plus one, two. So this information will help you up to help you to understand the most important theme, right? So I can see that this one is the uh, most important theme because uh, of the number of significant information connected to it. And you can see that this one has seven compared to other, um, the others have three, two, and two. So this one is the most important cause of um, um, burnout, right? So this is how you can do it in terms of the sorting. So do you have any question for me? Um, if you are not clear up- Maria, oh, Maria was asking about what are you using to do the codes? Um, I was talking about like the software that I'm using. Right. Oh, so um, in my book, I have, I talk about three softwares. Um, do we have a, something like software? <laughs> we don't have, okay, three software. So they are, let me type them here. Um, one and just is, so you know, Dr. Adu, they are using Max QDA in this course. And so they'll start. Oh, the Max QDA. QDA so, in about a week. Yeah, next okay. week they'll start doing some actual coding, but they've been practicing. Okay, so my book, I didn't use Max QDA, um, but I think it's also similar to in vivo. Um, and then I also use um, deduce. Deduce is uh, a um, qualitative software online that you can use. Um, I also use a free free qualitative software called um, what's uh, QDA Minor Light. Uh, so. It's a free software that you can use. Um, so these are the three softwares that I use for my book. But I, I, I think also QDA, and Mass QDA is also very good. Um, it's easy to use, similar to in vivo. Yeah. And also I, I also use Microsoft Word for 
the manual coding for students who don't want to use any software and they want to do it manually. Yeah. So. And so let me make a comment about that. I think, um, yeah, multiple options on how, how you can approach it. And I think manual is still maybe somewhat misleading, right? Because you still are using some type of technology to pull some things together but what mm -hmm. you just walked through was still very much it's it's not the drag the drag and drop that you get with some of the software options so deduce and in vivo or max qda but mm -hmm. it still allows you to 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 do the things you're doing so cluster i mean to code assign mean and meaning numbers categorize but understand i think for all of you the the data set that dr do is looking at is pretty small and simple to manage. Mm -hmm. Some of you, if you're going to have 20 interviews or more, and you might have an interview that each of those interviews might turn into 16 to 20 pages of data, it becomes quite a bit to manage manually. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I even said in my book that if you are using manual coding, um, then you have to have a small amount of data. If you have a big amount of data, then you have to use a software because it will also help you with the organization of the codes, right? So in the software, you know, uh, for manual coding, like using the uh, Microsoft where you have to count, and sometimes, you know, you might make mistakes and doing the counting or uh, putting, uh, telling the, the, the uh, codes. So it's always good to use software, yeah. Yeah, and, and you are right concerning the manual coding um, because, for this one, I, I sometimes I I, I also I call, I call sometimes I call this electronic coding because as you said you are using um, technically you are using technology to code right um, but most of the researchers you know categorize this process as manual because you are um, counting them yourself compiling them yourself and um trying to put things together yourself instead of you know using the software that you know the software can help you to tally the uh, automatically tally the uh, number of significant information connected to the code yeah any other question Oh, somebody's asking, well, I should explain again how to decide on a, a specific coding method. Okay, so uh, I think this, um, let me see. I think this diagram will be able to help. Um, so one thing that you have to ask yourself is, is describing the data or a phenomenon your intent, right? Is it the is the purpose of the study to describe um, a phenomenon or describe the data that you have? If yes, is relevant information generally hidden in the data? So this means that you have to go and review the data and see. Um, the kind of data that you have in terms of if you are looking for significant information uh, to address your research question, do you have to uh, make sense of the data threat? Do you have to tell your, ask yourself, what does this participant say? What does it mean, right? Before you could make sense and address your research question, if that's the case, then interpretation focus coding will be the best, right? But if it's, the information is not hidden, like this, the data that I, was show, I showed to you, um, then um, description focus coding will be appropriate. The presumption focus coding normally is used when you want to explain a phenomenon or develop a, a theory, right? And that will be good for you, right? And besides these um, strategies, there are many, many others, right? So you don't have to use what I have here. Um, there are 
we did have thematic analysis, uh, we have content analysis, right? So we have many types, you know. So if you think that maybe this, these are not really, it doesn't really fit your um, study, you don't have to use it. But I think I tried as much as possible, you know, after reviewing a lot of approaches, I tried to come up with a simple way um, that will help you to address your research question that you have. We have another question, Dr. Du, from Danielle. She says, are the steps the same for the other two coding strategies? Oh, um, the other co oh, coding strategy. Yeah, they are similar because you, um, the same process of, um, let me show you. So the, let's, say, let's, let's say we chose interpretation focused coding, right? So you're still gonna label your research question, right? And then when you are coding, um, you when you identify your um, the significant information, you have to uh, do a couple of steps, right? One step is ask yourself, what does this information mean? Considering, okay, mean, right? What does it mean? If a person says that, uh, say, uh, make a comment about something um, in order for you to understand a person, you also have to look at the person's background, right? And the situation that the person finds himself, right? If um, somebody says that today is my last meal, right? If a person said today is my last meal, and you don't know the, the background of the person, the situation the person finds himself or herself, you might not really understand what the person says. He's saying, maybe um, this is the last meal for the day for the person, right? Or maybe this is the last meal because the person doesn't have any money to buy any food at all. Maybe the person is homeless. Right, so you see how one statement can mean different things when you take into consideration who was telling you that and the background of the person. Right, so when it comes to this one, you have to first um, make sense of that, what the significant information, and then after making sense, then you develop a code, a phrase to represent your understanding or your meaning of that information that you have identified. And so that code will be representing the significant information that you have identified. Right. And for for the la for the uh, the the um, for presumption focused coding, you identify uh, first go through your data, look at the data as evidence, right? It's just the same thing as a lawyer. You, a lawyer makes claims about something, but before people, um, the claim can be convincing only if the lawyer shows evidence to support the claim. So you going through the data, the data is, uh, they, they are all evidence here, right? So you identify significant information as evidence, and then based on that, you make a conclusion. Oh, because of this, maybe a participant is hungry. Or because of this information, maybe the participant ne needs help, right? You have make a conclusion based on what participant told you. So the conclusion will be a claim that will be a code and the participant statement will be evidence that are, that's connected to the claim. Right. And, and, you know, in my book, I, I explain, you know, step by step how to do it. Sometimes you have to use um, some labels that um, uh, um, there's, I don't have time to explain um, in details. It's, it's a, a little bit complex, but you know, I think when you, you, you have time and go through uh, what I describe in the book, you'll be able to understand the process. This, um, the, 
third level of coding, which is a little bit complex compared to the simple, uh, the simplest one, which is the descriptive, uh, description focus coding. Can I add something, Doc? Yes. yes. And this, and thank you so much for bringing this out. I know for for some of for some of them, the this may be deer in the headlights moment because of where they are with understanding this and even executing it. But I think mm -hmm. this is a really important point to to hone in on because in reviewing chapter four with students and working through the process of coding and analysis and interpreting and then reporting that there are often times when i when i say i can't follow the logic in what you're writing right so mm -hmm. there's a science behind this and the layers that dr Ardu is talking about from coding to categorizing and and developing themes around that and providing evidence sometimes if you skip those steps in the effort to get done quickly or if you don't spend enough time doing one of those it gets choppy and so there's mm -hmm. a disconnect between what you may have as here's what you've articulated as a theme but i can't see how those layers cascade down into the codes and so mm -hmm. it it seems i know when we're looking at this for the first time sometimes it seems sort of high level and you might even interpret as, oh, that seems pretty easy. Now, no doubt, it, there's there are some parts of this that are relatively simple to execute and understand, mm -hmm. but the level of interpretation and analysis that he's speaking of really takes some some time, and it, that's where your scholarship comes in. That's when mm -hmm. your work in becoming a PhD and developing all this stuff and these competencies over your time in this program, this is where it comes to bear. Mm -hmm. And, and I always say that um, qualitative analysis is um, a skill that you have to develop, right? And upon me writing a book on this, I'm not perfect in developing codes and uh, coming up with themes, right? But the most important is the more you do, the more you become better and the more you become confident about what you do, right? Um, so it's it's a process. You just um, there's nothing like a perfect code. The reason why there's nothing like a perfect code is that that's why you have to define the code, right? So if you say um, having time with family, somebody might interpret it in a different way, right? Um, or it doesn't really perfectly represent the significant information. That's why it's always important to define your code. And also be flexible. Sometimes what happens is that as you are coding, you realize that, oh, I think engaging, um, having time with family is, it doesn't really best represent this information. So let me change it. Yes, you can change it, right? You should be flexible, can go back and change the code if you think that you have a better one to represent. As you are going through the data, you, you understand it more. So when you understand it, you can, you can go back and make some changes to it. So there's always going to be flexibility. But as um, Dr. Morris said, you always have to make sure that you are following a systematic process because that's the only way people will trust what you found. Coding is a subjective experience. You are you and your data, right? Um, participants were, uh, readers were not there or your audience were not there when you are doing the coding. So you have to be able to document the process so that you can explain to them how you move from identifying significant information into developing codes, how you move from developing codes into developing themes so that they will believe what you found, right? So it's all about documenting, it's all about being systematic and um, you become you you it's all about perfecting the process um it's a skill that you know um needs to be developed and you you are not going to be perfect the first time and i uh, me personally i'm always learning learning how to code better right so what you have here i have here may not be perfect right but um the flexibility for me to go back and reflect. And I can even change my mind that, oh, I think descriptive coding um, 
a description coding wasn't I wasn't able to get a lot of information using description description focus coding because I was just describing. What about moving into interpretation? Making sense? Will I will I get something from it? If the person say that a lack of balance with work and home life will um, will often cause um, physicians to feel stress. What does it mean? Who, who, who is talking here? Let me look at the person's background, right? Can I, can I get additional information from what the person is saying? The person is 27. The person has 12 years experience. Maybe the person is a female, the person is African-American. Can, can this background information help me to understand what the person is saying? Right? So sometimes maybe you will start with description focus coding, but you can change to uh, interpretation focus coding. The most important thing is to have a rationale behind. Why have you changed? It's, you know, you have to be flexible. At the beginning, you realize that maybe this descriptive was the best, but you realize that you are not getting enough information to address your research question. So let me, there's some hidden information there that descriptive will not help me to get to my destination. So I go to interpretation focus coding. And you can even use both. Some I've seen some studies where they start with descriptive and then they go into interpretation. Right? So it's all about being systematic and also having rationale. When people ask you, why are you not using presumption focus coding? What will be your answer? It's all about justifying your actions. Right. I'm gonna, can I add something to that, Dr. Abbas? Yes. Um, yes. Particularly about the systematic about it, which is really important. And so there are multiple times and I serve on committees for students for whom I don't chair. And so I don't necessarily work with them closely on the analysis. But when I read the document, and this is this is not just for me, but this is for everyone, even in just publishing your your work, your dissertation, we people should be able to ask you, show me the documentation. So show mm -hmm. me the system that you created. And so I've asked students in the past, export your code system to me so I can see it. Send me your uh, your summary tables so I can see what you wrote to help me understand how you got to this. Wow. And and part of what Dr. Adu is describing is, is sometimes it, it takes a while to sort of massage it and having conversations with others and even continue to look at the data. And I can tell you just today with a student with whom I'm working, I, I gave feedback to them looking at it on my screen that says, uh, I'm not yet convinced that the ideas articulated are fully aligned with the data you collected. Yes, the things you're describing so far were experienced, but I'm not sure they're at the theme level. My concern is that after reading earlier drafts of this, it seems there were many more positive experiences, experiences expressed by participants than you currently have in the theme presentation, right? So it's show me the system, show me the evidence that he mentioned, and now let me follow the science of how you put that together. So mm -hmm. it's complex, it's layered. It is a skill that you develop learning to be a qualitative researcher. So true, so true. Um, that's the only way people believe what you found, being able to demonstrate how you arrive at the themes that you have. So, um i can let me briefly touch on the second and the third uh, categorization strategies and then we can end this presentation um let me see uh, here so um group based sorting strategy is more uh, uh, about you know uh, this is where you may have to use as um um, quantitative approach to come up with the themes or the clusters, right? So you see how you did it. Uh, we I demonstrate to you the, doing it as individual, 
this this one you are involving people so if let's say you have you can involve participants to do the sorting especially if you are doing a descriptive um, description focus coding where you have summarized technically you have summarized participant uh, responses you can give it uh, the summary to them in terms of the course and let, let them sort it group them for you right on so you can if you have a group of 10 or more you can let them do it another one is let's say you want to involve um, professionals right uh, maybe mental health workers or mental health um, clinicians to uh, review um, uh, um, the codes that are related to maybe their work, right? And then they can you, you tell them just to categorize the code for you and then they bring it back to you. And so when you give it to them and they bring it back to you, right, you put it in SPSS and run analysis, and then you'll be able to come up with clusters. And I, in my book, I talk, I talk about how to do it. We have, you can do two main analysis, multi-dimensional scaling, and also hierarchical cluster analysis. And at the end of the day, you come up with clusters similar to what you have, uh, you, I did it manually here, but the system will help you to come up with clusters, and those clusters will be the teams, right? and that will help you to address your research question. And as I said, I provide detailed information in my book um, if you are interested. Normally you do this when maybe you are doing a participatory action research and you want to involve um, participants or involve stakeholders in maybe solving a problem or uh, implementing something, you know, you can involve them and use this kind of method. Right, that's the group based sorting. This means that you allow them to sort it, right? Instead of you in the, you doing it yourself, you allow them to sort it. They bring that information to you and you use SPSS or uh, any um, statistical analysis software to come up with um, clusters that represent individual categorization or the clusters that individual participants have done, right? Um, so that's all about the group base. Um, if you are doing it individually, um, you don't have to use this one, but if you want to involve stakeholders, participants, professionals, and maybe um, colleagues in coming up with themes, then you can use this kind of approach. And the last one is the presumption focused strategy. Um, it's quite similar to the one that we I talk about in um, the, the coding level. So this one, what we are doing is that now the codes that you have come up with will be the evidence, right? So you look at the codes, you review the codes, and then you come up with claims or themes. And then you you connect the code to the claim that you have come. So the, as I said, the codes that you have come up with. So let's assume that we are using um, presumption strategy for categorization here. So based on, so these are, will be evidence, right? So you go through the evidence and then you come up with themes and then you connect the themes to those, these evidence, right? At the end of the day, you have few themes and then a couple of evidence connected to the themes, right? So for this strategy, these are evidence and the themes are claims. Okay. Um, so that's all that I have for you. Um, if you want to get access to my book, you can go to Amazon and then search my name and uh, you'll be Philip Adu and you'll be able to get um, access to it. Um, if you want to ask to meet and have a discussion about your methodology, especially when you are doing your dissertation, uh, you can email methodology at the Chicago School dot edu or you can email me personally or you can follow me on Twitter um, or you can 
um, you can add me as your uh, LinkedIn connection colleague. Um, and what I do in LinkedIn is I provide a lot of information about methodology, articles that I see I found um, interesting and informative. And I share information to my followers. So you can also follow me on LinkedIn. So, so that's what I have for you. Um, I don't know whether you have questions for me. I'll be happy to address them for you. Or if you want to ask me about what we do as methodology experts and what kind of support we provide to students, and you can ask and I'll be happy to address. Any questions? I don't have any. That was pretty straightforward. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. And you told, um, I think I might have missed something. You told us where we could get, get your book. Yes, I want to go to Amazon. Okay. And you type my name, Philip Edu. The book will pull oh. up. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Right. Um, hi. Um, I have a question. Um, yes. But before, uh, thank you so much for taking this opportunity to, to come and, and uh, show us about cutting. Um, I You're personally need, need very much help in cutting. This is all new for me and mm. i appreciate it and yes my question is uh well i was a little bit late um maybe you talk about that but when will i know or how will i know the best coding software to use or yes Okay, so in terms of the best, um, it, 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 it depends on the student. Um, um, I can tell you what a lot of students use. Um, a lot of students use uh, uh, MassQDA, um, Invivo, um, Deduce, and QDA Manolite. Um, most of my presentations, uh, I use in vivo. I have a lot of presentation. Even in my book, I use in vivo. Um, and also, Max QDA is very good. I have a presentation also on QDA minor life. Um, so, what I always tell students is that first of all, go to YouTube and type the, um, the software that you are interested in and see whether you can get videos. When you review some of the videos and you are clear about the process and it's user friendly, then you can buy. And most of them, they have uh, a student version, right? Uh, which is not more than $150. Um, so it all depends on in some, you know, use. Um, so it all depends on you, which one will be the best for you. But me personally, the one that I use is in vivo. <laughs> Um, but as I said, uh, MassQD is also very good. Um, for the deals, one thing I like about the deals is that you don't have to download anything into your onto your computer. You can do it, everything is um, online, right? So you can upload your uh, information online, your um, your data online, and analyze it. You just have to log on, and when you finish, you can export that information. Um, but I can tell you the reason why I use the in vivo, deduce, and QDA minor in my book. I wanted to cover a lot of um, all kind of students. There are people who cannot afford to buy a software. So I use QDA minor light, and I have a presentation on that uh, for people who don't, um, don't have um, money to buy. And there are some people who don't want to download anything on their computer. They, they want to do it online, right? I demonstrate how to use Deduce. And 
most of the students that I work with use in vivo, and that's why I, I also use in vivo in my book. Um, and I didn't use QDA minor, uh, uh, mass QDA because it's quite similar to in vivo. Um, so, um, so that's why I didn't use, but it's also a very good software. And let, me, and let me add something I think is important in considering which software to use. Uh, I always encourage students to use something that someone on your committee knows so mm -hmm. that that helps reduce the learning curve for you. And so I use Max most of the time. I have used Deduced. And so when I'm working with students, I always encourage, say, pick one of those because I can help you because I know that. I, I understand in vivo because most of it, as you can tell from what Dr. Adu was saying and what he showed us, we know what the output should be. And mm -hmm. so the nomenclature within the system might be different. The, the direct function might be slightly different, but we know how to navigate to what, you, what we need to see there. So I would say trust the people that are closest to you and supporting you in the process. And so if you've got someone who says, hey, I know in vivo, I use that all the time, you're probably best served with that because they can help you through the hurdles you might have in trying to understand it on your own. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. The, yes, I, I appreciate that. But my question uh, goes more in terms because there are some softwares that they are friendlier than the other one, especially for those ones that those nothing that is just started. And that was my question. Even it's just like a first level, uh, just how to learn uh, the basic uh, foundations. Like, because um, some softwares, they are so pretty, pretty complex. So my, my question basically, uh, was in in that tenor. Okay, so for me personally, I recommend in vivo uh, to you, uh, and I also have a presentation that you know I try to break the thing, things down a lot concerning in vivo, and this is the presentation that I did, um, and it has been um, viewed two thousand eight hundred and fifty one times. And I think the YouTube, let me see the YouTube. Um, and I receive a lot of um, requests from outside um, concerning, um, like questions concerning that. So, and so it has been viewed 73,000. So um, I try to break things down for students. And um, if you are a beginner, I recommend in vivo for you. And especially if you have PC, not um, because most of that my presentation I use PC Windows. Um, so if you have PC, then I will recommend in vivo for you. Yeah, and, yes. Um, you can listen to my presentation. This is a basic understanding of in vivo. Um, mm -hmm. and that will be helpful for you. Yeah, thank you so much. But that will be a, a problem. I don't have a PC, <laughs> I have a Mac, but. Um, anyway, I just, um, I guess it's uh, foundations. Uh, I I need to interpret that foundation of coding in order mm -hmm. that I can then put it to work in mm -hmm. uh, any software. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. One other thing about choosing the software, uh, that's part of the reason why we have Max QD8 in this course, so you can get some opportunity to, to test it out and see how it feels, and mm -hmm. that that might be your choice. You might say, hey, I learned to use this in class. This feels comfortable for me. Let me move forward. Definitely not required. Right? You might decide, and I've done that before, say, hey, this didn't work out for me, and we even have I think John can speak to that in our class. He says, hey, I've been using one but it's not as intuitive for me, so I'm looking for another option. Hmm. And uh, Dr. Morris, is it free in your class or student has to buy? It's free, so we, we get a, uh, a a license for the duration of the course, and then oh. if they decide to purchase it after the course, they get, I think it's a 20% discount on the student license. Oh, it's great. Then if it's free, then use it. 
because you know for this one you have to buy and it's all uh, it's free. Uh, Okay. Any other so, question? All right, going once, going twice. I know we are 10 minutes over our scheduled time, but mm -hmm. I did not want to stop you because I know this was going really well. So thank you again, Dr. Adu, for all of your expertise and your wisdom and appreciate your time and sharing with us this evening. Thank you mm -hmm. to all of the students who are who joined us, and I want to end the official call right now. But I will stay on for a few minutes if any of you have additional questions about any of this or anything from the class that you want to address. And also thank.